Yeah, that's it. I met Quentin actually there at Western in the photo program. Um, and uh, he and I also share an interest in like experimental sound and harsh noise. We've done a couple of shows together. All right, we've done some noise work I'm together. I booked a show with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you booked a show with me, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyways, and I've just been impressed with uh, just in general, like your photo work, like the range of, of stuff. I don't know exactly what you're going to talk about today, but like you were doing all sorts of crazy abstract light installations at the same time as you were doing like very simple, like Polaroid portraits. And so like this huge range of interest and also the depth to which you sort of drill down in each one of those it was really cool. It was like, I had a lot of respect for that. So I'm happy that you could join us today. Um, I have not talked to you since you got your master's degree. I know it's um, been a minute. The older, wiser Quinton, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, cool, I'll just turn it over to you. Um, yeah, and then I'll be taking notes through the whole thing. So if you see me like looking down and writing, I'm not ignoring you. Um, and then, yeah, at the end, we'll just have like 10, 15 minutes for questions. And of course, I don't know, Quentin, I don't want to invite people to step on you, but I'm sure people could just jump in with questions at any time, right? Definitely, yeah. Happy to answer any questions, uh, either in the chat or just... Uh, you know, just start interjecting. Uh, <laughs> but Dana did tell me that this is a photo class. So I did uh, pull from my uh, photo archives, both new and old, just to talk a little bit about photography and sort of like what it's meant to me. But I also pull uh, images of like some of my new work uh, and depending on how much time we might even uh look at some some secret upcoming works uh nice. just to say what could happen um, <laughs> tasty uh, as well as just like yeah thinking a lot about how at least in my own process like uh certain things definitely like change but other things like certain themes ideas uh feelings kind of always come back like uh do i have oh perfect yeah, you should have screen sharing vision yeah. just want to make sure that i'm it's been a while since i've done a zoom so i gotta make sure i'm doing this correctly like, everybody can see when a uh interesting zoom uh, glitched out panel. I can, yeah. Okay, now I see your slideshow. Okay, so we're all in the slideshow. So this is a photo of me in my natural habitat, uh, <laughs> sitting on top of a pile of uh, plastic curtains that I was using. This is like my, I think this was my first MFA studio when I first got to Tyler. So. Just a little bit of background on myself. Um, my name is Quentin Maltonado. I uh, got my undergrad uh, BFA at Western in the photo program, sort of like with concentration and like more new media stuff, I would say, uh, as well as photography and printmaking. Um, and then I just recently got my MFA in 2020 at uh, the Tyler School of Art out here in Philadelphia, where I'm based right now. But uh, at graduating into the pandemic, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, and how it kind of affected my process a little bit uh, as the time sort of, uh, or a, as that comes up. Yeah, um, yikes. I can't even, oof. It was, a, it was an interesting time. Um, but as this is photo, I want to start off with, uh, talking about photography. And so, uh, start with some portraits. Uh, this image was from a photo series that I was doing at the end of my undergrad experience out there at, uh, Western. And I was thinking a lot about just light but also historical reference wanting to sort of like a engage an element of like a painterly quality. I think there's a lot of like connection between painting and photography. And this was a thing that the photo professor 
at Western Garth, uh, really tried to instill, I think in a lot of, uh, the classes that I was in with him was this kind of, uh, interplay between the two mediums. And especially as we sort of hurdle into the future, the way in which photography creates this like crisis point for painting in which it's like, if you can reproduce the world, then why are you painting the world? But in that same way that like push towards abstraction, but also like the, the movement away from certain like aesthetics opens up and painting opens up space for photography. Uh, so a thing that I think a lot about is like, I, I read this review of a, um, Velasquez, I think it was, uh, retrospective and the writer talks about how Renaissance portraiture feels different because it creates the feeling that you're like standing with somebody that there's like a presence there. And I think that that for me is like the thing that portraiture really, it has this capacity to do for us, but it's also one of those things that feels, uh, lost in a lot of our interactions with, uh, images as they sort of like, I don't know, become like the social image, I guess you would say is like the sort of like critical theory term for this and which like that. I <laughs> yeah. Uh, in which like, like the history of portraiture is this kind of like feeling of a connectivity, like that there was a kind of aura is how Benjamin and talks about it that you're looking at something that is like real in some sort of way or like you're you can kind of know this person like when it's a really good portrait you feel really like the the depths of that person or like a kind of level of empathy uh in their presence but social media sort of makes it in which like the ease and which are images like even our self images are like reproduced. Like they go, everything goes so fast that you can't actually hold on to anything anymore. And how does that like change our own relationship with our own images? And so I think that that's for me, like the quest with portraiture is like this impossibility of like bridging the gap to a degree. And like, uh, finding the way in which like we're, we're seeing the person in some sort of way, uh, like we would see somebody in front of us rather than treating somebody's image as like this, like object per se. And I mean, I guess that's also the problem with photography is that photography is a very like objectifying kind of, uh, medium, like it, it literally bounds inside of the frame, uh, like the world. And Clinton, I, I had a question to jump in there. You said the magic words, hold on to, um, yeah. <laughs> up to this, up to this point, we had been looking at photographs of objects, like of physical Polaroids. Mm -hmm. Was that a key? strategy in, in like your interest in portraits? Is this a digital image? The one we're looking at now? This is actually a four by five image right here. It's still, still a physical we're, object. We're, we're going through time and space, right? <laughs> uh, because this photo is probably the earliest of all the ones that I've actually, yeah, earliest, second earliest of all the ones that I've shown so far. Uh, definitely one of, but, uh, because this is a mutual friend of Dana and I, uh, Ella, that I shot, I think at the end of my time at Western using the four by five cameras. And if you haven't used the four by five cameras, I don't know if y'all will get to it in this course, but, uh, 
they have them in, uh, oh, what is my main median Polaroid? Oh, I like to use, I have a Sun uh, 660, which I do love, but it's kind of shitty now over the years. And so have made the switch up to uh, the one step with the eye type film, which I like. Uh, I think it's pretty good. Uh, it's much more consistent, I would say, than my older Polaroid. But uh, I also have, I fortunately, I didn't show any of these images. Or, yeah, didn't show any of them for this one, but uh, a uh, SX70, which I do think it takes some of the best portraits that you can get. Like, that's a sexy camera. Oh my goodness. But uh, it does have to be basically like bright at all times if you really want to get into it. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of my my Polaroid build, I guess. <laughs> uh, I would love to get like, I also have hiding around here somewhere, one of the wide Fuji Instax. Uh, uh, and I love those as well. Like, I love that, uh, that ratio is so wonderful. I know everybody likes the skinny ones, like the, the Instac minis, because they are just like the most flattering and cute, but real one, Alexander Wang did his, uh, um, like one of their photo, uh, collections on the, the Fuji Instac wides. And so real recognizes real. <laughs> I just I, as long as it fits in my phone case that's all I care about <laughs> I mean so much of our world is just dictated by our phones now yeah I didn't mean to derail you but I was curious if you could talk about like I don't this is totally derailing but like up to this point it's just because you said portraiture is like you could hold on to this knowing of the subject and mm -hmm. how much of that translates to the physical object or how how important, I should say, is the physical object in your workflow? And I know we're just getting started and you probably have lots to talk about this. So maybe you could weave that into your talk as you go. <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, this is a digital scan and I have uh, an actual, uh, I think a 16 by 20 print of this. And making prints, I think, is an incredibly important thing. Like I shot an incredible amount of uh polaroid especially at the beginning of the quarantine because like um uh i felt like i wouldn't remember what happened if i didn't have physical like reminders like those kind of like facebook like one year ago today you were uh duck you were you were sheltering in place and it's like oh that was happening uh and it's easy to kind of like move right past it because it like that kind of stream, it's just, it's water that just flows right through you. Uh, whereas having the physical record of those things and especially of taking like Polaroids of people like wearing masks and everything, like, uh, there's a vision of it. That's much more like clear in my memory as to, uh, I don't know that time period. And I think that that is why <clears throat> like making prints is such an important element of the artistic experience because like, um, I mean, I think it's just like, there's a, even though it's flat, like, uh, we're now so alienated due to technology that even the flatness has like a kind of subtle like sensuality to it and uh like it just gets lost when we're just trafficking in a world of like exclusively like digital images especially like as they become more and more like i or whoops skipping ahead i don't know how to get back <laughs> uh there was a question in the chat also Aha, back book. Nice. Parts of a from digital scans. Uh, no, because I have, thank you, Uncle Joe Biden, with uh, 
uh, flat Biden dollars. I got a flatbed scanner, which is the shit. Uh, but I mean, the, I think the thing that you lose is like the imperfections, which is a weird thing to say, but there's like a kind of, uh, uh, like, like a randomness or like a contingency that happens whenever you're doing things in like the dark room or like you're printing and the rollers do a weird thing. Uh, like, uh, those types of moments. Uh, you kind of did this and like a, a kind of directness, which is like, that gives it like a physicality. Whereas like clicking on a mouse, just kind of, it makes it the same as any other file whereas when you're working in the dark room and you're like got an actual like negative or something then uh it's uh it's there you're looking at it you're you're dusting it off you're taking uh you're you're examining all the machinery like um and it feels much more alive in that way i think the immediacy i guess the the like the the possibilities of unknowns are still all open. Like anything could happen in this very organic process where like once it's digitized and you're working in Photoshop or Lightroom, there's less chance of like something accidentally happening and like it growing. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I mean, one of my favorite things is to make contact, uh, sheets, uh, wonderful. And you see, you might have to explain what that is real quick. Cause these are non-majors. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so a contact sheet is when you actually lay negatives directly onto a piece of photo paper and then you expose the light through it. And so it creates through the direct contact, it creates the, uh, the positives on your paper. Uh, and you just, uh, I think seeing that at, you see like the different color combinations but also the kind of randomness of the film like certain colors like in one panel will be a little bit different than another and like as you kind of like like uh i mean i love working in like diptychs i realize that these are all signal images but especially when you're like actually installing like a show all of a sudden associations start happening and that process for me really begins in a lot of uh, respects at the at the contact sheet uh level or at least it used to now i'm now i'm a polaroid uh and digital or like i do a lot of color because it's easy to scan and i don't trust anybody to develop my black and white film personally uh but these uh last three color portraits have all been uh 35 millimeter color um, and i do think there's something about 35 millimeter it's just it's the best film that you can get it's wonderful i was watching a movie that was shot on 35 millimeter the other day and it looks fantastic still uh, and there is like i mean certain uh theories about the way in which like the grain being circular feels more natural to the eye than the pixel which is square but i i don't know much about any of those types of things at the end of the day but i just like you know there's like a weight and like a, a meatiness everybody actually feels like uh like textural in a different way that film is able to catch and like, not because of its higher fidelity, because I think that like at this point, like 4k, k all these things like really surpass like our ability to even like see as good as like, like fidelity that it's able to capture. But, um, I think, I don't know, that sort of like goes to the way in which digital technology is have kind of like formatted our brains. Uh, to think that higher quality equals like greater truth. And uh, I'm here to tell you that there's something else. I don't know. So, uh, but yeah, 
So that's the portraiture section. So if anybody has any questions or thoughts about portraiture, uh, we can definitely come back to that. But I want to talk a little bit about architecture because I think Dana knows uh, architecture, definitely one of my first photography loves. I dragging around uh, the four by five and uh, taking it all over the school, uh, trying to just capture as many things because I think part of it was like I was under a kind of like, like, Wanting to simplify, I was really, uh, or in my practice of like trying to figure out ways to like simplify my process, like more rationalize my eye. I think, uh, thinking about like grid and repetition and like openness. Cause I think that that's the thing that's very interesting about photography. It's like, uh, it's a subtractive process, kind of like look at the world and then you're like, I'm going to hone in. Whereas a lot of other artistic mediums are like a additive process. Maybe this goes back to the, like the dialectic between painting and photography, but it's like paint, you're adding on photography, you're taking off. And so wanting to sort of engage in that process. And architecture is such a good way to just kind of like, uh, think about that for me, at least, uh, and wanting to sort of like find these like moments that feel what, well, structured is maybe the right word, but I don't, I'm not sure. Like, uh, like kind of, uh, organizing but also kind of looking at looking at the way in which especially like these more suburban areas or like urban areas become so highly rationalized and like trying to bring a like like investigate them in a kind of real way rather than that or or like maybe the they're like spaces without people in a lot of these images and like i've been thinking a lot about um or i'm always thinking about this book uh capitalist realism and one of the things that like i think photography can show us when we think about like the built environment uh, it's the ways in which the built environment, uh, sort of is less there for us and more there for the movement of like things and money. And so this kind of more minimalistic, like emptiness and the spaces, uh, I think like a, I, I find both a, a very like Zen kind of peacefulness to them, but also kind of like an eeriness to that experience uh, that we create this thing that immediately either subjugates us or like puts us on the outside of it. Um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's intense. <laughs> so think that I might be getting a little bit too heady. So if I am, please, I apologize, but it's randomly like a thing that I've spent so much time in various like institutional spaces. I think, uh, like academy or like more fine art spaces and things. And you kind of get this feeling in which like it can be very dehumanizing in a certain way. Like the, 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 the flows are very like inhuman, uh, and the people are just these like ornaments that kind of move in and out. Uh, and so I think a lot of my architectural photo just focuses on, on that kind of like that emptiness to a degree. 
this is such a oh sorry yeah go ahead (laughs) no no go right ahead please i know i was just gonna say this is an interesting counterpoint to like you open with portraits which is like all about connections to people and then you immediately follow up with this architectural series which is like a negation to that (laughs) (laughs) well you gotta find you a man that does both that's what i believe (laughs) oh my goodness uh, because I do think that there is something to be said about, uh, like things and their opposite, I guess that, uh, you can't just look at one thing from one side or else you're only getting a part of the picture. Uh, cause I think that this like, um, uh, comes out a lot in, especially like in American kind of like mentality and ideology is that there is like we're we're all we're cause and effectors uh and so we kind of have this mentality of looking at a thing like uh it the uh, it goes a to b to c um and we kind of uh can easily get wrapped up in like this kind of forward momentum of like rationalizing or like trying to kind of uh, scientifically understand it from this like linear perspective. Uh, and so it's, I think important to like try and think of the opposite of that as well. Cause, um, I mean, everything always contains, uh, it's opposite in my humble opinion, but now I'm on some like Taoist shit right now, but, uh, but I do think that it's like a good exercise just creatively or artistically to be like, like I always hated doing, uh, especially when I was doing four by five, like, uh, architectural work. The last thing that I really wanted to do was be like, uh, I have to tell a person what to do, like get comfortable in front of a camera, my God. Uh, but it's like, if you do, like all of a sudden you see like more subtleties in both if you, you know, uh, flex your, uh, creative muscles in both directions. Like somebody that I think that does that incredibly well is like the artist Catherine Opie, uh, who, uh, her series on like, uh, transitions is just like such an incredible like portraiture series. But then she goes from that to doing like, the ice houses, which are these like ultra long shot, like four by five, uh, images, very like bi- almost like totally white landscapes. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, that's the type of like range that I think really shows consideration, uh, towards the medium, like towards the crash. Um, what, what time are we at? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so this is the new stuff, but it doesn't have much to do f- about photography, but I'll I'll just uh, wax and wait a little bit, I suppose. Um, So for installation, this was the very first installation that I ever did. Uh, it was like um, called Rainbow. This was at a house venue back in Bellingham, I think probably the first installation that I ever did after graduating. Um, and so it had, uh, two channel sounds, light smoke, like the whole, the whole shebang, like very kind of like, uh, enveloping and experience. And I think it comes out of like, I mean, it partially does come out of photography and but thinking about like light time space like those are really your kind of building blocks of photography just in general and so wanting to like play with those senses uh became like a real fascination for me and so this was uh which one is this this is blue reminder uh which was probably the first like complete installation that I did in, uh, grad school. 
And so you kind of walked around these uh, different spaces and each of them uh, actually uses a, a trick that Dana taught me of wiring up different uh, uh, solar panels to what, essentially like musical equipment, guitar equipment. And so it becomes like an optotheremin. So as you move, like the tone of the chain or the tone of the room changes uh, due to the light that is being reflect refracted and opened up by people moving in and out of the curtains. Uh, and so this really got me thinking a lot about just like movement and but also like religious spaces i think it's something that i'm very fascinated with or just like kind of spirituality and like the way in which that is created or like uh bestowed upon different spaces um and how like i think i guess you could call it like holiness or like spiritual charge is like created by this kind of like inside and outsideness like uh it has to be this thing that is separated and like from the world which is this thing that is like uh like explicitly not spiritual i guess <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness yes <laughs> and so i think a lot of the works became about that kind of uh interplay whoops went one too far uh and then this one was like kind of very just simply based off of like a paper lantern and thinking about getting people to move around in a circle uh, around it. And so as you moved around the pillar, it created like different tones using like a motion activated uh, speakers. And so if you walked a full circle, you could create like a chord essentially. And so uh, through movement, like, kind of like play with it but also are a part of the piece and like getting that kind of like thinking about that fluidity between being a part of something versus like being inside of something or outside of something and how that uh that barrier is much more about our thought of things rather than like our actual location in them uh, more documentation stuff. Oh yeah, so this is a reprise of that first installation that I did in uh, grad school, but this time with the addition of like screens that are playing different things, or the screen on the right is actually playing a video art piece, and then uh, this panel on the left is an led panel but there's black light glowing on it so as you move it shifts the tone of the screen um and just thinking about that yeah engagement in space and like creating like more meditative spaces and sounds and uh so that was a lightning fast uh installation art run but Got to open up a little bit of time for questions still, and we got videos. So I want to talk a little bit about video art. Video art is one of my favorite things on earth. Uh, a lot of video art, people are like, I don't understand. That was just somebody like saying the same word into a camera for like 20 minutes. And we are like, I loved it. Uh, You're like, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. why it was awesome. <laughs> exactly. I think it's one of the like the the barrier to entry for video art is one of those things where like hey if you know how to press play on a camera you can do it uh and there's something incredibly liberating about that and the moving image has this like i don't know this atten intensity and assertion that you can't get in a lot of like static mediums which i appreciate uh and so I have a few videos that I want to show us, at least like clips of. Um, hopefully they will work. Uh, but this first one uh, is called Flood. And this was one of the first video art pieces that I think really got 
closer to something that I was trying to say or like think about. This is like using uh, like analog video synth manipulation to sort of like degrade digital footage uh, to hopefully like expose some of the kind of like uh, no, the digitalness of it all uh, and thinking about like water and we talk about like surfing the web uh, it's called the stream like all of these kind of nature metaphors for like the internet experience uh, but I'm also big into like more meditation practices and so it's sort of like uh, it's not particularly like technophobic in trying to like examine those things, but like trying to find a type of like peace, right? I guess. So let's watching that editor too. Okay, we'll leave that there. Uh, all of these videos are on my YouTube, by the way. Shout out to the YouTube. Best best art sharing platform on earth. <laughs> nice. And they all have a, uh, there's a link to your website um, in the class. So yeah, we can hunt these down. Oh, perfect. Uh, are you going to, are you going to talk about the sound in these at all? I suppose I could. Nice. Uh, yeah. I, I make all the sounds. I do the bleeps and the bloops. Uh, yeah. Especially like, I think Dana knows my, uh, history of being, a uh, metalhead, uh, noise, uh, musician, experimental music, the whole, the whole gamut. But, uh, and I guess this is one, like it gets back into the, the effects of COVID is like, I was spending a lot of time just indoor. And so I had all of these cassette tapes that I was using to make tape loops from that were all just like, you know, dollar bin, like ambient new age records that, uh, lots of uh, like swooping, whirling winds and like, uh, pan flutes and whatnot. Uh, and honestly just kind of fell in love with like, uh, new age music and started to like, uh, like, uh, it, it became like the, the backbone of a lot of the kind of meditative pieces, um, uh, is trying to kind of 
emulate, but maybe not too much that kind of uh, sound. And so uh, in that same vein is this video to melt into air. And so this is a guided meditation video um, where if you watch the screen, it'll give you a full meditative experience. Uh, you will find a level of uh, nirvana by the end of uh, just five minutes. Uh, and this was sort of like brought about by watching a lot of these, like, I'm not going to call them scam artists per se, uh, but there are a lot of uh, spiritual gurus who post up on various social media websites. Uh, and a lot of it is based much more around getting you to be accepting of your current conditions rather than actual like enlightenment. And so kind of playing with that idea uh, and turning it into this video piece. Watch it. We'll watch it a little bit here. Oops. Oh, and it was just about to get good. Um, that's that is awesome. So we're we're just to give you a, a time marking, we're about fifteen three minutes out from fifteen minutes out. Okay. Uh well I have one more video that we'll watch another little clip of. Let's Okay. Uh, and then we'll call it good from there. And we can have a our little group discussion or uh we can just shoot the shit, whatever. <laughs> uh so this one I will throw down a content warning. There are some this uses an audio sample from uh that has some uh, interesting language about mental health from a uh, departed uh, Jerry Falwell Sr., who was a religious right-wing fanatic. Uh, so I'm telling you directly, me, the artist, to you, the viewer, this is not an endorsement of his opinions or thoughts. The, uh, any and all content should be viewed satirically. Uh but thinking a lot about 5G and digital kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like digital conspiracy kind of uh, uh, anxieties. And so 
we'll talk a little bit more when the video's over. Or that should be up some more of the video. There are some who have lived longer and lived harder than others. But the fact remains that there is nobody in this audience or in any, any other audience anywhere who is immune to or ignorant of this thing called trouble. The Bible also clearly teaches that discouragement often results from trouble. There are many reasons for discouragement, as men would give them. But I should think that the number one cause of discouragement is trouble. Most of us do very well when things are going our way. Most of us are happy when things are going our way. Most of us are courageous and strong when things are going our way. But this is not the real test of spiritual greatness. I would like to make a statement right now. A statement which I've made many times before. If you forget everything else that I say in this message today, I want you to remember this statement. Here it is. You do not determine a man's greatness by his talent or by his wealth, but rather by what it takes to discourage. I have never known God to use a discouraged person. If you get discouraged and then tell somebody else about it, they get discouraged too. And they agree with you and you get more discouraged and you both jump off the bridge. Discouragement is contagious. You get one discouraged person in the gang, and everybody's going to get discouraged before it's over with, unless they dissociate themselves from him, or somehow encourage him. Second Corinthians is the book of encouragement, for God in chapter 1 is called the God of all encouragement. It is not the work of God that anybody should be discouraged. What is discouraged? I think the Bible definition of discouragement is, it is the opposite of faith. Faith is taking God and his word. Discouragement is refusing to take God his word and choosing to feel that about things and circumstances. Then that means discouragement is sin. For whatsoever is not the faith, Romans 14, is sin. I'll tell you when you get in trouble. I think we'll leave that there. <laughs> so, uh, well, oh, the end. Perfect. <clears throat> nice. Uh, there's a trash truck right outside my window, so if it gets loud, then it'll be passing. Oh, yeah. Um, cool. This is awesome. We're a little bit tight on time, but Bennett, Solar, Andrew, I know I've, I always have a million questions, um, but I want to let you guys go first. Um, we haven't really talked much about your um, like career trajectories, like how you went from Western to where you are now and where you're headed. But um, anyways, ask away. Anyone have any questions for Quinton? I guess, um, like, obviously, like, you've got a very, like, a lot of uh, experience and, like, a kind of story and progression. And so I guess I was wondering if there was one piece of advice that you knew, like, when you're starting out, what would have made things kind of, like, easier or that you would have, uh, like, just, I guess, just like to know when you were starting out? Mm. Oh, save everything multiple times in different locations. Never have all of your stuff saved at the same location that is easily either lost or uh, taken away from you. Uh, that would have saved me a lot of heartache throughout the years uh, because, um, I mean, it sounds simple, but uh, keeping actual records is like, it's so key to your longevity because you think that you're going to be like, ah, it's just me. I can make it any time. Uh, and actually that is not quite the case. Um, the other thing would be, that's my like purely practical advice. Uh, more theory and practice advice is just that like, uh, artistic production is just about actually getting into the studio and doing it in a lot of ways. And it's like, uh, do you think that there's something to like allowing inspiration to hit and like, uh, being aware 
of yourself and the spaces around you to be like open for when inspiration hits. Uh, but if you're not like actually in the flow, then you won't be able to capture those moments when they actually occur. And so like, uh, even if it's just like, you know, writing a thing down on a piece of paper or something, uh, a day or like, uh, like doing a one a day shoot for like a month or like, uh, being like, I'm going to draw something like just staying engaged keeps you, uh, active and staying engaged is like the chicken versus the egg thing. But like, if you're making work, then you'll make work. Uh, and like, and it's just, uh, I think that that's just good advice for all of life. Honestly, like you gotta, there are certain things that are totally out of our control, but like those things that exist inside of our control and like, uh, those opportunities that arise, like, uh, if you're not taking them, it, the, oh, what is it? The Wayne Gretzky thing? Like you miss a hundred percent of the uh, shots you don't take. <laughs> so that's, uh, that I think would be the thing that, uh, would be important to remember, but also that it does take time and, you know, you go through dry spells. It's okay. Uh, anyone else? Questions or Sol? Another question? Uh, I had a question, Bennett. Um, I was just curious what you think about like mixing mediums because like I make music as well. I mean, I don't know if you make music, but you said you make the sounds for your video art. I mean, like you probably could put it in like, I'm assuming it also has to do with like your galleries and whatnot or those art pieces. Um, but I'm just curious, like, do you think I personally, like, I'm trying to mix mediums in a way. I'm not sure, like, how I want to do it yet, but um, what is your opinion? Like, I also paint as well, and you were talking about painting kind of relates to photography, and I've seen a lot of ways of, like, mixing certain mediums, and I'm just curious, like, what you think about that? Oh, it's the best. You got to you gotta be mixing up your mediums. Uh, almost all artists that I know today are, like... Uh, like multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, whatever you want to call it. Uh, because uh, I think that that's just kind of the world that we live in and in a lot of ways. And a lot of those like barriers have been broken open in such a way that it's like, it's a, uh, it's worth putting your own stamp on it, finding your own secret sauce. Uh, like, and I mean, especially when it comes to video art, video has always been so interconnected with like the exploration of multiple mediums like uh there's a movie called the wolf house that was like a argentinian movie that came out a few years ago uh and it's all painting and puppets and like voiceovers uh so many different mediums happening and it's like those uh I would encourage anybody who wants to try and do something that, that is blending different disciplines. A lot of those people like who are like the the upper echelon of photography, like or of the early modern era, like Alfred Stieglitz, Paul Strand, a lot of those guys who are called like quote unquote like straight photography. Uh they they're called straight photography because it's bland. You can do better. Also because they're all straight men, um, which is a different thing that has more to do with it, but it's like, there's just no need to leave yourself like stuck in any one discipline that you like go, go where the art takes you. Cool. I was just curious, like if I should, I don't know, I guess it was just, uh, you're about your thoughts were on it, but yeah, thank you. I, mean, I would bet it. I would echo that times a thousand yeah like follow all of your interests allow them to ebb and flow and influence each other and it will become going to use the word secret sauce like that will be the you the thing that makes your work exclusive to you know everybody else's awesome thank you 
Um, shoot. Yeah, we're at the edge of time. I want to make sure I don't cut off any questions from anyone. Um, I did, I had a, like, if you could talk for two seconds, I feel like you're just from what you've shown us your work and this might be like the two sides of a coin kind of thing that you talked about earlier. Um, I see like a definite like criticality. Like I know you said that your videos aren't technophobic, but I would say they're techno critical. <laughs> um, I see like a, the lens of criticality when you approach sort of like the techno stuff <laughs> and then maybe architecture, but then like your portraitures are so full of like to not be cheesy. They feel very loving. <laughs> So like I, I had a hard time sort of in my notes. I'm like, this other stuff is critical. What is this? What is the other work? Like the portraiture and the installation feels very sort of like you're welcome with open arms or like, come here, let me give you a hug for lack of a more technical term. Could you talk for like two seconds sort of about that? Am I seeing that correctly or am I misunderstanding? Are you also critical with your portraits or are you loving with your architecture? I think some of the architecture is like, loving but like it's a very kind of it's a very rational kind of love whereas like the portraits i think for me at least like the portraits are i i don't want them to be art to a degree and so i let it go i, I let i let go of a lot and in that respect i just want to take them uh and that kind of takes the the pressure off for me to try and like make them be something more uh i think it's from working in the jc penny's uh portrait studio and that just giving me like horrific nightmares uh but like it's like my way of like purging that kind of experience out of my body uh but also i think part of the portraiture is it's just like uh i think a lot of my portraiture is melancholy uh, to a large degree because uh, it's one of those tough things where I'm never sure if I'm like taking a photo of the person or if I'm taking a photo of myself or like using the the model as like a conduit for some sort of thing that I'm trying to say about I don't know my own sense of like a kind of like melancholy sweetness uh and then I think for the installation art, it's just about like, yeah, like the, the drive towards like meditative space, but also like, I don't know, like I, I have a big fascination with psychoanalysis. And so to a certain degree, it's also about like, uh, all of these spaces are like kind of closed rooms and they become these like, uh, it, it gives a lot of like potential to like delve into something deeper and uh but it's like not a rational thing it's like an emotional sense of like being uh and like freud talks about how before you have the development of the ego there is this like space in between in which like you are still like conscious but it is like a pre-egoic consciousness and so it connects to everything and then as we grow up we begin to have those like definitive physical lines like the edges of my body but also like we create these psychological barriers in between us and the world like us and not us but if you can make that like more slippery uh i think it's uh a good exercise to recognize that like yeah we are combined to like the flesh body but uh our the the life of the mind and the life of like our kind of like social spirit uh it, it goes much farther than that nice thank you well we are we are past time by three minutes so thank you Quentin. thank you so no 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 it's it awesome um yeah, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, Andrew, Saul, and Bennett, thank you so much for joining us live. Those awesome, excellent questions. Thank you again, Quentin. I appreciate it. We have a round of applause for Quentin. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all nice. for being here. I really appreciated all of your questions. Cool. Uh, Andrew, Bennett, and Saul, I will be talking to you guys later in class. And um, Quentin, yeah, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time.
Ah, my pleasure. Any anytime. Nice. Uh, again, if you guys want to see more of Quentin's work or get in contact with him, um, the website is linked in our class. Yeah. Hit me up on Instagram. I'm back on it for the moment. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Yes. All right. Take care, everyone. Peace, y'all. Thanks again, Quentin.